A gorgeous day outside at one of my favorite cities and one of my favorite meetings, TCT for CardioSource World News Interventions, is always an important meeting. And we are here to discuss some brilliant work that highlights a common, previously unsuspected complication of heart valve placement. And this is from New England Journal of Medicine online before print. Uh, and what I would like to do is first off introduce you to Dr. Raj Makar, who is an MD and the Director of Interventional Cardiology and the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. This is possible subclinical leaflet thrombosis in bioprosthetic aortic valves. First, what was the impetus for this study? Good morning, Rick. Uh, last year, just before TCT, uh, the Portico IDE trial, which was evaluating Portico transcatheter heart valve versus commercially available valves, was halted. And that's because in the Portico study, we were doing CT scans to look at the frame. Now, one of the sites, uh, uh, in fact, uh, did a CT scan on a patient who had a stroke after the procedure. And when they did a CT scan of the valve, they actually observed that a couple of leaflets were not moving properly. This led to further investigation of some of the other patients uh, that did not have a stroke, but we looked at the CTs and we actually observed that this was not a uncommon finding. So this led us to uh, stop enrollment in the study. And this was observed both with the commercially available valve in addition to the portico valve. And we decided that we would actually undertake an investigation uh, and also prompted us to start two registries, one in uh, Los Angeles at Cedar sinai Heart Institute and another registry actually in Copenhagen, Denmark with Dr. Lars Sondergaard. And yeah. this was the impetus to actually go ahead and launch this investigation. Now, in this particular study, this is the first systematic scientific study using four-dimensional CT angiography to assess valve performance of TAVR and surgical tissue valves in patients with aortic stenosis. So what exactly did you do? Who were these patients? How many? And what did you find? Okay, so what, we've, what we did was we looked at all the CT scans that were done in these patients. And what we observed in the clinical trial subset was that almost 40% of these patients had some degree of abnormality. Now, I think I must stress that we label this as complication, but I think I'd rather call this thing right now as an imaging observation. Okay. I think what we need to do is we need to understand this better. But what we also found was there were certain predictors in the, in the trial subset that actually predicted this. For example, patients with low cardiac output were actually more prone to having this particular observation. We also found out that when you implant the valve too low, these patients had this uh, imaging uh, abnormality. What we then did was we wanted to assess the incidence of this in real life setting, you know, you know, in, in, in a mixed bag of patients that we do in real life with transcatheter aortic valve technology, what is the prevalence of this? And also we wanted to find out if this also occurs in surgical aortic valve, because surgical aortic bioprosthetic valves have been used for 30 years and nobody's really talked about that. So that was equally important for us to assess. Now, if you can see who might be high-risk patients, what do you do about it if you know that? So I think that those observations from the trial subset were preliminary. In fact, only 55 patients. What we found in the two registries combined was that the incidence of this phenomenon was not 40%, it was 13%. So I think it's fair to say, when you look at some of the other published literature, which hasn't used 4D CT, but similar techniques, one or two other small studies that are out there, that the incidence of, thing, of this phenomenon could be about 10%, 10 to 13%. But nonetheless, 10% is not trivial, it's actually quite significant, and I think what we decided to do is uh, f first find out what is this phenomenon? Because when we first saw this, there was a little bit of disbelief because you know, when you do trans uh, thoracic echocardiograms, the gradients were actually normal. So we actually thought this was some sort of an imaging artifact in the way we acquired images. But then of course, we studied this systematically. We did transesophageal echo and in, in patients where we actually saw this abnormality, we were able to confirm it, that this is actually a real finding. So uh, the next thing was, why is this motion abnormal? Is it related to blood clot? And what we did was 
gave Coumadin to some of these patients. Not all of these patients were treated with Coumadin because we didn't really understand the significance of this. And in patients where we utilized uh, warfarin, there was resolution of this phenomenon when the CT scan was repeated. In patients who were not treated with warfarin, the abnormality persisted when the repeat CT scans was done. So essentially, uh, it was this whole um, aggregate data that led us to believe that it was the thrombus that was formed on the leaflets that was causing the whole issue of restricted mobility of, of the uh, leaflets in the valves. So obviously the answer then is not that all the people with devices should be on blood thinners. Uh, I think it would, be, uh, it would be premature and I think it would be, uh, I, I think the first thing that we need to understand is what is the significance of this phenomenon. Right. So we need to look at clinical outcomes. Our data set is small and the follow-up is not long. And what we observed was there were no clear-cut differences in clinical outcomes. We noticed a, a trend or a signal for TIAs in the registries, but this was not seen in the, in the trial subset. So I think it is fair to say that the data were inconclusive in terms of clinical outcomes, especially for strokes. I think what we need to do first is we need to understand what does this phenomenon mean clinically, and for that we need to do more studies. So I think that in a patient population, currently where transcatheter aortic valves are being used, a patient population that is at higher risk for bleeding, to routinely administer anticoagulation probably would not be the best approach. So we are not recommending, and I'm not recommending, that we should give warfarin or some other anticoagulation to these patients on a routine basis. Was there a difference between TAVR and SAVR? I probably should ask that. Uh, yes. So uh, I think that the, the answer for that is the study was not really powered to look at those differences. But having said that, we saw this phenomenon. If you read the manuscript, it says that there were two out of 27 patients. There was an additional patient when the first CT scan was done, a surgical AVR patient, where the findings were indeterminate, but that patient came back for follow-up three months later, where we repeated the CT scan, and that patient did have an abnormal valve. So the true incidence there was three out of 28 patients, and we described that in the manuscript. So I think it is fair to say that at least in the small data set that we have, we saw this phenomenon about 10% of the times, both with surgical aortic valve as well as with transcatheter aortic valves. I think we need bigger studies. Uh, if the focus is to find out, you know, if it is more prevalent in one versus the other type of valve, then we'll have to do larger studies. But I think it's safe to say right now that this is a class effect in terms of all uh, bioprosthetic valves for aortic valve. So is the take home message here essentially at this point, stay tuned? Yes, I think at this point we need to do more research to understand the clinical implications of this. I think that we should become aware of CT as an additional imaging modality, not just before TAVR as we normally use it to screen patients and to plan our procedures, but CT can be a valuable tool. Four-dimensional CT and geography, and geography can be a valuable tool in select patients. For example, if you have patients where the gradient is going up, where you have unexpected heart failure, somebody who's got a stroke or an MI or additional thromboembolic event, I think it's fair to say that 4D CT should be done. And we should, we should interrogate the valve to make sure that we do not have any thrombus on that valve. Congratulations, because this is quite a, a great study and a very brilliant piece of work. Uh, I agree with, with New England Journal on that one. And I would like to also say that this is from New England Journal of Medicine, so it, what you need to do is check the end of this right after I say, at uh, TCT, I am Rick McGuire, the executive editor of CardioSource Global News.